Today on Crested Butte is Home, my guest is Ben Ferimsky, and Ben is one of those fly fishing aficionados, and in fact, he makes his business uh, revolve around fly fishing. He has an online bookstore. He runs conventions at several major cities across the U.S., all about fly fishing, and he also travels the world uh, fishing uh, for other species that we don't don't have here in the Gunnison Valley. But he does still live here and loves the fishing here in the Crested Butte and Gunnison area, and we're going to talk about that and all things fly fishing today on Crested Butte is Home. Okay, we're here today with Ben Ferimsky. So, Ben, tell us a little bit uh, about yourself, where you're from, all that good stuff. I grew up on the East Coast between Pennsylvania and New Jersey. I've been here in Crested Butte for 21 years now, I think, um, and uh, work in the fly fishing business. All right, so so fly fishing's your thing, and skiing's your other thing, right? So. Like those are your two biggest things. Yeah, right? yeah. I worked in uh, in the skiing business, teaching skiing for twenty eight years prior to this. Oh wow, that was a long yeah. time. Um, so, so fishing. So, what's what's the what's the appeal of fishing for you? Uh, for me, it's mostly where it takes you. You know, it takes you to beautiful spots, uh, wild spots, mostly. I mean, I fish some. Some pretty cool urban spots too that are yeah. interesting. That you know, you just get to learn about the the life that can live right in a city that you, most people are walking by and have no clue that's going on, uh, and learning about the environment as well. So, how does that compare? Like, fishing is a little bit, you know, more sedentary, let's say, than than skiing. So, what's what's the what's the appeal for each of those as, as they compare with like? how active they are i guess it can be but uh, i mean just like skiing you can you can take it to a level that's much more athletic like backcountry skiing where you're climbing it and skiing it and you've got risks to evaluate but the same with uh same with fishing i mean you can you could climb down a canyon into a remote spot um and have to swim across a river in rapids and Push it, push your levels of the challenge of on the physical side just as well. Um, but fly fishing in general versus just fishing is much more active. You're you're, you're casting and uh, just the just the act of fishing is much more active than throwing out a bait and waiting for a fish to bite. You're presenting it. You're casting all the time. Uh, bait fishing is for beer drinking. <laughs> right, right, totally. Um, so you've fished all all over the world. So talk about some of the places you've been, and what you were fishing for there, and uh, and then when you're done with that, uh, about how how different is it from Crested Butte? Like how do they compare? Oh, well, that's what I mean about uh, what I like is the places it takes you. Uh, fly fishing and fishing in general, it can take you from the Arctic to the tropics, and yeah. I've fished from Alaska to New Zealand and in the tropics in the equator. And I mean, I fished places like Cuba. Uh, um, I fished Argentina and Chile and Brazil. And uh, I'm leaving next week for Iceland. And, nice. um, you know, all, all different species, different kinds of water, salt water, um, fresh water, rivers, lakes, whatever so you get you get to see different uh ecosystems in the process and how different is that i mean is it like as different as nordic skiing versus alpine skiing almost some of the time or, or is it still... much more different really? much more different in fact like i've thought about that um being passionate about both skiing and fishing and you you can go to way more places uh fishing than you can skiing because skiing you're limited to mountains and places that have snow for the most part i mean right i guess you could go ski in a mall in japan but uh yeah or, uh, <laughs> or china uh, Ab- or abu dhabi or whatever yeah there's there's a yeah, in yeah. there but uh, actually a cover of the most recent fly fisherman magazine is in dubai uh fishing for queen fish right outside the city in the harbor so which is a fish that i'd really like to catch actually huh so you can go 
the, the biggest difference is that, you know, you could be in the same sort of environment like fishing in the same mountains in Alaska where you would ski, you're just in the valley floor, but you're still in that environment. Or you could be on a tropical flat on a remote atoll in the South Pacific. Right. You know, which you're not going to be skiing there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. That's true. So how, how does Crested Butte stack up to all these other places you've been in terms of the fly fishing? It's great. I mean, it's, uh, you know, there's places that are obviously more remote, but it is remote and you can get away pretty easily in Crested Butte. Uh, you can get into the back country, you can fish some of the major rivers and they're still not crowded comp- compared to a lot of major rivers throughout the, the U.S. at least. Um, and there's uh, ample ample fish, some variety. We don't have a ton of variety outside of the trout, but you can catch brook trout, brown trout, rainbow trout, cutthroat trout. Yeah. Um, you know, you can fish dry flies, nymphs, streamers all the time. Um, we've got a pretty pretty decent season, especially if you look at the tailwater of having the tailor or even just driving, you know, to the Gunnison and like the lower stretches, you could fish those year round. So, right. you know, which, which is one of the more limiting factors sometimes in a, a colder mountain atmosphere is just gets kind of cold to fish. But like this winter it was great fishing all winter. So how does Crested Butte compare to like to the rest of Colorado or, or other parts of the, of the West? We've got good variety. I say that our creek fishing is some of the best, the small streams. We've got a ton of ton of little streams and uh so like, just, like like brush creek like or smaller even or, or what, what Yeah, kind of even uh yeah, anywhere in that. Not, smaller would be like maybe the slate on up through some of the smaller stuff. I mean, you go on a bike ride and stop somewhere and look at some of those creeks, you'll start to notice some some fish um yeah. in there. They may vary on size. Uh, but almost all the water that you find around here has fish, where if you went to, like, Telluride, there's less, in, uh, and you run into a lot more uh, acid mine damage. Right. In the streams, you look and you see these orange streams, and some of the some of the places don't have it. Or you're in places where they just, they just never had fish in them, so they don't have fish. Um, but here, everything does. It just might v- vary on the type of fishing you do the size of the fish or what kind of trout it is but they all have it so gotcha. if you saw a spot and you're like that looks good i'll try it you're likely going to have success and there's tons nice. of water so that really stands out and then our bigger rivers are not as crowded as a lot of the other places right it would be nice if we had something like the roaring fork valley is pretty similar to here except they're busier and then they, but they do have the colorado which is you know, one step up from like the Roaring Fork's pretty similar to the Gunnison in our stretch. Right. So they have that little bonus, a little big, bit, big, big water. Big river. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. So you mentioned uh, that you work um, in the fishing industry. So what do you, what do you do? And tell us a little bit about that. Uh, I produce fly fishing, consumer fly fishing conventions. We have seven nationwide locations and um, they run through from January through the beginning of March. And, uh, it's a uh, it's place for customers to come in and purchase product, book trips, meet the guides, talk to the manufacturers, look at new product, everything uh, everything that you could think of for fly fishing is yeah you know, see demonstrations, talk to the pros, meet authors, right you know everything that you could think of for fly fishing under one roof basically. How does that work out doing that from little old remote Crested Butte when most of these conventions are are in big cities on the east coast? Yeah, I mean it, it's going to be it's going to be a travel oriented business in any case. Yeah. I mean the only the only chance I could have is one convention in one city because we are based off of uh, demographics. A lot of people wonder why we don't you know maybe do one in Montana or or. Uh, at, you know, other famous fishing spots are like, well, there's no not many people not that live people. there. Right. We're, we're not going to where the fishing is necessarily good. In most places it still is, but we're going for population to attend the right. events. Um, so I could possibly live in Denver where we have one, for example, and be close to that show, but I'd still have to travel to the other six. Uh, the challenge for working out at Crested Butte is that travel is just a little more difficult. Yeah. And yeah. more expensive, so that right. that's the only challenge. Otherwise, it's 
it would be the same no matter where I was. Right. And you make it work. I mean, that's... Yeah, I still work basically for myself. Yeah. Nice. Um, and you also own a fly fishing uh, online bookstore, too. So uh, yep. why'd you start that up and what... Um... Uh, the anglingbookstore.com. Well, that's an interesting question, actually. Uh, my my dad and his business partner started the fly fishing show that I now run. And his business partner had a a bookstore. He was, a, he was actually a wholesaler of books, a distributor. And he... He had a little, uh, I think it was called Art and Angling. It was a little convention that he held, mostly to sell some books. And my dad was doing another event that was a fly fishing kind of uh, seminar style weekend uh-huh. with some experts. And they met up and kind of combined to form the fly fishing show. And as he continued to do his uh, book business, he had a booth within the shows selling books as a retailer. Okay. And then uh, the show started to expand to the West Coast. He didn't want to travel out of that, and he was also starting to fade out of the book business. And he, uh, there was a need for the books. It was an asset to the show uh-huh. uh, and you know, a chance to make some money. And I didn't have much work at the time. They asked me if I was interested in doing that. Okay. And I said, sure, because he knew I enjoyed books and asked me if I, uh, he said he would help me, guide me through the ordering and get me set up on that. And uh, so I did some of those and then he kind of faded out and I sort of kind of took over his retail side of the business. Nice. I didn't, I didn't know that's how that one worked for you. Yeah. Um, so like most fly fishing fans, you, you tie a lot of your own flies. So uh, why'd you get into that and what are some of your favorites? Yeah, I would say that that's probably one of my uh, most known and strongest aspects of my personal fly fishing. I've designed a number of flies for a number of manufacturers. And, I mean, I first got into it because my dad taught me, and it was fun, and it was cool, and just something to experiment with. And But then uh, once you start tying a few flies, you realize that the reward of catching the fish on something you've created is is greater so more reward. And then the other main reason that I do it is to, I really enjoy the design aspect and the problem solving. So if I'm in a situation where fish are feeding on a certain is insect and I, I feel there's certain characteristics that they're keying in on um, to fool the fish, I like to go home and try to design that fly to match that situation and you know and then go out and test it and see if it works so i really enjoy the design nice. aspect i don't enjoy when i got to sit down and tie like two dozen of the same thing I'm like, right it drives me kind of crazy because while i'm doing it all i'm thinking is like oh i want to try to tie this one. Ooh, i want to try to tie that design like tweak it a little bit or yeah, something. yeah yeah but i know i just need to tie a bunch of the same ones so that's why right. I, I actually started designing them for companies that can just mass produce the fly that i've created Once the formula for Huh. A lot of people get into it too to save money, uh-huh. but in the long run, you don't really save much money. Some right. some flies, but yeah, yeah, you got your time. And I could probably sell all my equipment and you know buy enough flies to last me forever. Most of your life, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's your favorite spot locally? And I'm sure you'll give away your secret stash, but <laughs> yeah, you know that could vary every day. Yeah. I mean, it depends on the conditions. It's like asking you your favorite skiing spot. Totally, I mean, yeah. your favorite spot one day could be terrible conditions. You're like, I'm not going there, but you know somewhere else that could be good. Right. And therefore, it's a different favorite spot. Yeah. Um, same with fishing. It could depend on the water conditions, what you're in the mood for. Maybe I want to be on a float trip or fish a bigger river, or maybe I want to be by myself in a small stream in a beautiful setting. Uh-huh. Or, I might be in the mood to uh, do a certain technique, you uh-huh. know, and so I the the spot matches my mood more than the spot just, just being my spot favorite. That you always get back to you. yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's certain spots that are beautiful. I mean, I love going down in the Black Canyon. It's it's yeah. an amazing special spot. Or I like fishing Brush Creek or the Slate River is great too. Beautiful scenery. You what part of the Slate do you, do you usually fish? Uh, different spots. I mean, I've gone through stints where I fished the town ranch quite a bit. Oh, okay. uh, it can be challenging there. I like that. It gets pretty technical. Uh, I used to fish up by like Old Joyful a lot. I used to guide up there quite a bit. It's beautiful scenery. Or um, 
down lower, you know, if you can get some access through the lower parts, anywhere from town down to where it goes into the east is pretty good too, but mostly private. Gotcha. Today on the Crested Butte Real Estate Minute, I thought we'd talk a little bit about Almont Real Estate. And Almont is located where the East River and the Taylor River combine to form the Gunnison River. So obviously this is a great spot for people who love to fly fish. And uh, the median price of a home there in Almont is 599000 over the past 12 months. But there's a very wide range because you can buy a mobile home or a cabin, but you can also uh, look at properties that are several million dollars in the Wilder subdivision, for instance. So if you have any questions about Almont Real Estate, please let me know. My name is Frank Consella, and my website is com, and you can find my contact info there. And let's get back to the show. Um. Well, no, uh, no talk about fishing would be complete without a few stories of the one that got away. So let's hear some stories of the fish that got away. Oh, that, that's kind of a smart question for you, actually. I, uh, <laughs> you sound so surprised. Well, yeah, I mean, people <laughs> ask you more and tend to ask you more of what was your favorite fish or your biggest one or things like that, uh, almost like you asked my favorite spot. Right. Um, for example, I got asked amongst, I think there was like maybe 15 of us, that got asked to do a short couple minute presentation on our favorite fish at a uh, at a banquet uh-huh and I got to be one of the people and most people did this exotic fish or a big fish or something that was memorable to them and I went up and I showed these just random pictures and I was like well this is where I lost the biggest this that I had. This is where uh-huh. the biggest one of these got away. This is where I missed the biggest one of these. Just a bunch of broken lines. Yeah, stuff. like agony of defeat pictures. And uh-huh. everybody afterwards was like, that was awesome. Because <laughs> that, yeah, it really is the ones you you, you kind of remember. And that's what brings you, makes you come back. Because you know that the potential is there. And you want to try, right. try to reach that goal. It might be like going on a ski trip and... Yeah, finding like, a spot that's awesome and you're like man i really want to come back here on a powder day yeah it's like the hunt for the perfect conditions like yeah over the head that's what it perfection is or something exactly yeah. like safe and bomber and yeah. nobody there um but i don't know i mean there's so many that have gotten away right all everywhere everything that i've fished for yeah yeah i mean even to the point where one time i was in denver and on a jog on a trail in like Littleton and uh, went by this pond and I saw like four or five goldfish in the pond uh-huh. that someone must have thrown out and they were living in the pond and I was like I never caught a goldfish so I went back and got, <laughs> got some gear out of my truck and went over there and I could I didn't succeed in fact just last week a buddy of mine uh, in, in Colorado Springs posted a picture they caught a goldfish in a pond and I was like, oh, man, that's like the only fish that I've tried for and not been able to catch. Oh, my sister's got some quai in a pond in her backyard, so I'm sure she'd be fine with you catching them. <laughs> I, I doubt it. <laughs> um, Pet fish. <laughs> so, all right, well, let's go down this vein again. So what's your least favorite fish then, since this is, you just said that it was... My least favorite yeah, there's fish? There's got to be a sucker fish that you just hate or something, right? Or an invasive. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, I, I mean, some invasives could be could be bad, but, I mean, brown trout are technically an invasive species. They're, they're not native to North America and hugely popular. Um, the, uh, I would say the least favorite fish is the fish that gets in, wa- in the way of you trying to catch another fish. Like uh, one, yeah. one great example I have, uh, one of my favorite fish to fish for is permit. Super challenging, very technical, super weary fish. And where, where are those at? They live in the on the flats in the tropics. Okay. And, uh, well, okay, they can be in deep water, but you, ch- you chase them on the flats typically. Okay. Um, and we saw a permit, and I made a perfect cast to it, and he came over to eat it, and we all of a sudden I had it eat, and... I mean, these are a fish that people can chase their whole life and never catch one. Uh-huh. Um, and the permit took off, and my line went in the opposite direction, and we were like, wait, what? And uh, and here there was a little bonefish that was just following the permit around and kind of hiding in his shadow, and he 
raced out and stole my fly from the permit. <laughs> and I mean, people spend, you know, over the country or whatever. I mean, millions and millions of dollars just to go catch bonefish every year right and i wanted to just whack that thing off the side of the <laughs> side of the boat till its eyeballs popped out but <laughs> i let it go and swim right. away but it was really frustrating that he stole the fly from the fish that i wanted to catch and you know sometimes that happens yeah yeah all right well um so you get to call crested butte is home uh-huh. and um so why do you why crested butte why not somewhere else uh, I kind of ended up here by default, like a lot of people, and, and actually fly fishing is probably what really kept me here because I came out for a ski season, and it was a good season. It's one of the better seasons that I've had since here, yeah. uh, and I think it was the second year you lived here. It was, was first year, wait, no, it was our first year, both, 96, 97. I yeah. Was, that was our first year, both of yeah. us, I think, okay. so. You just you, you were here a couple years before. Yeah, for a while. I, yeah, I had been here earlier, but yeah. Yeah, great season, and um, I just always wanted to guide somewhere in the Rockies, uh-huh. fly fishing. So I decided to stay for the summer and guide, and now it's a lot longer. <laughs> Were you gonna like go back to the East Coast after that summer and like get an engineering job? Because you're, I know you studied engineering or what? what yeah, I mean, I did that the year before. I spent uh, I spent the winter in Utah, and then I went back east and spent. You know, I grew up on the beach there, so I, I was dying to get back to the beach and saw, when I was in Salt Lake because it was getting hot and dry and yeah, I wasn't near any water, um, so needed to get back to the water and went back for the summer and was looking for some engineering jobs and didn't find exactly what I wanted. Uh, applied to a few, but most of the stuff that was in my field was places I didn't want to live. So uh-huh. came back here, out here the next, uh, the next winter and kind of planned to do that as well, but then wanted to try a summer before work and enjoyed that. And then winter came and might as well just go kept, skiing again. Might and, as well go skiing again. And, and then it was summer. Might as well go fishing again. Yeah, and here I was closer to the water, so my my fix of being close to the water helped. Uh, gotcha. You know, I, I I wasn't didn't feel as isolated as I did in Salt Lake when I was like turning a hundred degrees and right and doesn't get as hot in here city. either. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so where can people learn more about you if they wanted to buy a book or go to one of your conventions or any of that? Uh, well, uh, our website for our fly fishing show is flyfishingshow.com and my bookstore is theanglingbookstore.com. Gotcha. Anything I should have asked that I didn't? No, I think that was pretty thorough. Um, I mean, we didn't talk a whole lot about skiing, but our focus was to discuss fly fishing and reasons that I lived here and... And that's that's great. Cool. Yeah. Who uh, who else should I interview? Who else should you interview? What are you, what are topics are you looking Anything. for? Anything. Someone someone across the beach or the Gunnison Valley that's just an interesting person in any any field any subject. Have you talked to any artists? We have quite a few artists. Yeah. The, the, the last interview I just did, Kate Seely was mentioned. So yeah. Yeah, that that she's on the list. But yeah, she would else? be she'd be an interesting person. Um, there's a couple of authors from town. And uh, some that have had books made into movies. Just look up some of those folks. Who's who's? I can't even. Yeah, I can't. I can't think off the top of my head. But we can. Right. I'm sure we could look we'll, that we'll up. Look it up after this. There's two or three. <laughs> There's one that um, just did a signing at uh, Rumors because I saw it in the paper a couple of weeks ago. They did a book signing, and it said their book was made into this movie about. Whatever the you know whatever it was, it was like kind of. I think the title was changed for the movie, but it was based on their book. Huh. And as a local nice. resident, yeah, I didn't know who it was. I kind of was intrigued by it a little bit, so that's why I remember I'll reading that it. Out. Yeah. Cool. That would be cool. Or how about some ranchers? Yeah, that's a good point too. That would be really that. cool. I know. Um, you know, the Nikolais have been involved in preservation. There was the big thing with the Trampy Ranch that's just going under land preservation, so that would be yep. something pretty cool, and I bet you'd get some characters talking into the ranching world. Uh, probably, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks so much for uh, for interviewing today, and uh, see you out there. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah.